Hi, and welcome to everybody to uh, our first intellectual property innovation engineering webinar. Uh, this is something that I'm hoping to start doing once a month, um, and we have some more scheduled through the rest of this year, so at the end of today, we'll actually kind of go over that schedule a little bit so you can see what's coming up. Um, today, we're going to go over, uh, as you know, uh, understanding trademarks, and it's gonna be more kind of hands-on looking at uh, what is the information that you actually get when you're looking at applications online at the USPTO? Uh, I know we go over some of this in innovation engineering, but uh, I know there are, I always get tons more questions on what do different things in here mean, and so I just wanna kind of show you that and also just give you a better idea on what the trademark office is looking at when they're actually examining your trademark uh, applications, so then you can figure out some of the stuff in advance of actually having to go and meet with a patent or trademark attorney. So, um, a couple of things I wanted to go over here first is just some general information about intellectual property. Um, obviously, we've got patents, trademarks, copyright, and trade secrets. We're gonna focus today on trademarks. And um, trademarks are different from patents and copyrights in particular in US law because of those types of intellectual property, it's the only one actually not even in the in the Constitution. Uh, patents, trademarks, and uh, trade secrets actually are identified, and so uh, trademarks, because of that, can actually last indefinitely. Um, because the others, by way of the Constitution, say that they can only be rights for a limited time. So trademarks can be great because you can have them last for hundreds of years if you continue to use them. So just some uh, general information here about trademarks. What are they? They're source identifiers. The idea is that when somebody's buying a product or service and they see a trademark, they know from experience uh, whether or not you know, they had a good time, it worked well for them, or whether or not you know, it's, it's something that they want to uh, purchase. Uh, it has to be used in commerce. So you cannot actually go and buy a bunch of trademarks and sit on them and then go to something like Procter & Gamble and say, hey, I'm sitting on these trademarks, you have to buy them off of me. So that's very different from domain squatting. So uh, just keep in mind that you actually have to use it in commerce, and you've gotta use it legitimately, and you have to prove that to the trademark office when you're actually getting your trademark registrations. As I mentioned before, they can last forever as long as you're using them. We actually have some marks here at the uh, the Eureka Ranch that uh, we've had for well over 20 years, and every couple of years, we've got to go and prove to the trademark office that we're still using it. And so every company and organization has to do that as well. Um, trademarks are also different than patents and copyrights because you can actually get uh, different levels of protection. Uh, most states, you can get trademark protection. Um, what we're gonna focus on today is just federal protection. Uh, even when I had my own practice, I almost never got state trademark protection. It's uh, mainly because most states actually don't do any searching. So uh, somebody else in, in another state might be using the same thing uh, and you, you don't really have protection. And a lot of people make the mistake of using that R with the circle around it symbol right there on the slide. Uh, thinking that if they get state protection, they're allowed to use that, and that's actually incorrect. Um, that can only be used when you federally trademark your uh, trademarks, <laughs> federally register them, and if you misuse that symbol, you can actually lose protection on your trademark if they find out that you're willfully doing that and keeping other people from using something that you actually didn't protect. So you wanna be careful on that. And we're gonna go over the trademark symbols here in just a moment as well. So what can be protected as a trademark? Uh, clearly product and service names. Uh, but everything has to be associated with an actual product or service. You can't just do a, a carte blanche company name. So like Procter & Gamble doesn't have protection for just the name Procter & Gamble. It has to still be associated with particular goods and services like detergents or, or, or baby diapers. Um, that's how they have to protect it. Uh, you can do slogans. Let's see here, it's clicking through very slowly. <laughs> Logos, uh, shapes, colors, sounds, flavors. I've got some examples here. So the NBC tones, those 
The three chimes of NBC are actually protected as sounds with regard to entertainment services. Uh, yeah, here, here's a group that we're working with here in Cincinnati, XU. Uh, they've actually protected the uh, Xavier X symbol, obviously for education. Uh, the Coca-Cola bottle is a great example of a shape that's been protected. It's the shape of the uh, cocoa bean. And so that's actually protected with regard to bottle shapes for beverages. Uh, Chiquita Banana, obviously Eureka Ranch, we've protected it. We've got that protected many different ways. That's obviously the logo right there, but then just the term Eureka Ranch, we have that protected with regard to obviously education and also uh, consulting services. So that's protected federally. Uh, I have the Pink Panther up here because actually the color of pink insulation has been protected. So nobody else is allowed to use that. And uh, flavors is now something that's kind of new in the trademark area, which you, know, you get to read about in the blogs all the time. But a company uh, actually tries, is trying right now to protect the flavor orange with regard to a certain kind of medication. Um, I think it's a bad example for somebody to try and take to court because really, just like with patents, your trademark has to be meaningfully unique. And there's not a whole lot that's meaningfully unique about an orange flavored medication. If they were to do some bizarre flavor like, I don't know, we'll just say kiwi, mango, chocolate flavor, that would be meaningfully unique when it comes to medication because you wouldn't expect it to taste like that. Um, but then orange, that's been a flavor that's been around for uh, medication for some time. But it gives you an idea of what can actually be protected. Um, and keep in mind with, uh, just like with um, patents, you know, to be meaningfully unique with trademark, there are some standards. And here's what they actually look at at the patent and trademark office. They look at whether or not your mark looks different, does it sound different, and does it mean something different from other trademarks? And is it in a different class of goods or services? And we're going to go over that. So, and they compare that to all the other registered trademarks in the United States. And keep in mind that your trademarks would only be registered in the United States. You're not going to get protection in Europe or Mexico and Canada and Japan. You have to go to each of those regions or countries separately. But by filing in the United States, you can actually get precedence going into those countries as well. Um, and what we like to say is that the trademark office looks at the sight, sound, and meaning of your, uh, your trademark, and they'll compare all of those things. So um, if you're registered in the United States, it really means that the United States Patent and Trademark Office has found your mark to be meaningfully unique, and you've proved that you're using it in interstate commerce. So here in Ohio, I couldn't sell something to somebody up in Columbus and say, hey, I've proven that I've sold it. I'd actually have to sell it to somebody in another state or in another country. And then, okay, and this is a question that I had several attendees I know for today's webinar email me and just say, hey, David, please explain to me these different symbols. Okay, um, first of all, the top two there, the TM and SM, are essentially the same exact thing. Uh, TM is for trademark goods and products. Um, SM is service marks for services. Um, we just generically call them all trademarks. It really doesn't matter if you were to put a TM on a service mark accidentally. Like most of the marks at the Eureka Ranch here are service marks. We're doing education services, we're doing consulting services, and yet I still put the TM on our trademarks that aren't registered yet rather than the SM, and it's mainly because people recognize what TM means and they don't understand what SM means. So rather than just kind of confuse it, I just put TM and that's completely acceptable. Keep in mind too, you do not have to file anything in order to put TM on a trademark. As long as nobody else is using that same one and you are starting to use it, I would say put TM on it. We do it here at the ranch all the time. And then if all of a sudden you find, hey, I do want to get protection for this, then you go through the federal process and you get the R with the circle around it, which means that it's been federally registered. That means you've gone through the entire process, not just that you filed for it, but you've actually gone through and it's been completely approved. Okay, so then I mentioned these classification issues. So right now at the Patent and Trademark Office, and this is the same in almost every trademark office around the world, there are 45 classes of goods and services. And whenever you file for your trademark, 
you have to identify your mark with at least one of those classes of goods and services. And keep in mind, there's no carte blanche trademark protection for all goods and services. If you wanted to get protection in all 45 classes, you'd have to file to get protection in all 45 classes. And your uh, fees go up for every class that you're actually going for. And keep in mind, you still have to show that you're selling goods or services in those classes. So here's what you guys really wanted to see, I know, is we're going to go on to the uh, USPTO website. So and if any of you want to follow along, um, you know, in a small window there, just, it's USPTO.gov. And you'll see when you get to the site that what I'm going to suggest first here that you do whenever you're looking up for uh, a new trademark for yourself or your organization is go up and just go straight up to trademarks and go to Manuals, Guides, and Official Gazette. It's the fourth button down on there. And then you're going to get to kind of this messy page. And I know it's, it's kind of not good looking, but Trademark Office website is actually pretty user friendly once you know your way around. But I would go down to this Acceptable Identification of Goods and Services Manual. This is where you find out what classification that you should be looking in. Because you really want to focus your searching into what classification your goods and services are in. So like with Eureka Ranch, if all of a sudden a car company were to go and file for a car named Eureka, um, we really it would not bother us because we're not associated with automobiles. However, if somebody's filing something close to ours in the education or business consulting area, I really am going to take notice, and all of a sudden, you know, we're going to have to do something to stop them. So what we'll do is right here, we'll put in some terms, and I'll show you how these results come up. And as we all know, the ranch enjoys their coffee. So you just say, hey, we're making, our company is a coffee company. We have a new trademark for coffee that we want to do. Just go ahead and type in coffee right there in the search terms and hit submit. And you're going to come up with, and these are all the pre-approved descriptions of goods and services at the Patent and Trademark Office. So all of a sudden you can see right away you've got antioxidant enriched coffee, you've got coffee extracting machines, and you can scroll down and see all these different types of coffee goods and services. And here in the second row is the class that it would fall into at the Patent and Trademark Office and any other trademark office in the world. It's going to fall into the same class. So I, and I'm not going to bore you with describing every single, you know, what each class is, but um, you can see just by looking at some of them that class seven here are, are, must be some sort of machines because everything here is a coffee extracting machine, a grinder, a grinder, and then all of a sudden you get to 11, you can get down to roasters. So it must be, and keep in mind that what class all these fall into is really determined by international boards. And so it's really good whenever you're searching is just go to this trademark ID manual here and just put in your terms and so then you can save yourself a lot of time by finding out what class you really should be focusing on. And keep in mind, you might want to look at several classes. As I mentioned here at the ranch, we protect things in education services and consulting business services. Those are two different classes of services. So I search both of those and I will even go here to the ID manual and see if there are some descriptions in, others, in other classes that are somewhat similar to ours, so there could be a little bit of overlap, just to make sure that nobody's getting too close to us. So I'll go and search for, say, Eureka and in different classes just to see. And I'll do another example here. You can just go ahead and click right there. You don't have to go back. And uh, God knows that we love our pizza here, too. So we'll see what kind of classes come up with pizza. And you can see right away pizza cutters, and there's class 08. So, uh, so it must be some sort of kitchen utensils in that class. And then you get down to 30, fresh pizza. And then down here in 39 and 43, Pizza delivery, pizza parlors, those are actually the services. And there's no real clear line exactly at the Patent and Trademark Office where this happens, but between usually classes 1 through 35 are always goods and services. 
and then 36, 35, 36 on to 45 are always services in most cases. So this is where I would start whenever you're you know, looking around, find out what class you need to be in. That being said, let's go, I'm gonna take us back to the start here so you can see, no, we're not gonna do their little feedback today. Um, but if you wanna then do some searching into the trademark office, uh, database, and I know some of you have done this when you've been here for Innovation College, this, and this is how I always do my searching, is go right back to the beginning here, hit trademark search, and just do a basic word search to begin with. And a couple of you had sent me some uh, different trademarks that you wanted us to look at, so I'm gonna pull up one here that was requested, it was PMET. So, two records come up, and you're gonna see that there's some differences in both of these that you can start to figure out a whole lot before you click on either of them. First off, anything that you find in the Trademark Office database is going to have a serial number. That's assigned immediately whenever you file an application. Whether or not it ever turns into a registered trademark, it's always gonna have a serial number, and that stays with that trademark forever at the Trademark Office. Then you can see that some have a registration number and some don't. So the second one here, the second PMET, has a registration number starting with a one, and that tells me it's actually a fairly old one, um, but you can see the one above does not have a registration number. And that tells me that one, it never became a registered trademark, but then if I look to my far right and see that it's dead, it tells me it was either abandoned as a, an application or it was just completely killed by the trademark office. And I can show you how we can figure out some more here, but right away, that's what it tells me. Now below, this one, I see it has a registration number and I see a live status over here. So I know right away, this is still an enforceable trademark at the uh, federal level. So let's go ahead and look at that. You can click on any of these numbers or uh, letters. It's gonna take you to the same exact place. So this is gonna be the screen that you're gonna see, whoops, <laughs> on any uh, trademark uh, um, that you're, uh, data that you're looking at at the Patent and Trademark Office, and right away, you're gonna see it's a word mark, and it just says type drawing up here. And what that means is that this is a trademark that it doesn't matter what the font is, the size, the color, as long as those four letters are in that order, P, M, E, T, they get protection with regard to their goods and services. So, and that's the broadest protection that you can get for any trademarks. That would just be your standard word mark. But then what we wanna do is look right below that with goods and services, and you see this IC042. That stands for International Class, and it's an International Class 42. And if you remember from what I said a few minutes ago, since the class number is above 35, 36, uh, it's going to be a service. And then what you can do is just look right to the right here where it says Waste Management Service and Engineering Services. That's the, the description of their services. So they get protection for Waste Management Services and Engineering Services. Does that mean then if I want to open a law firm tomorrow, which would be legal services, could I name it PMET? I probably could without any problem, although some people would say that legal service or waste management. Um, and you could, I could get protection. This probably would not be a problem for me. Likewise, if I wanted to go and make a pizza cutter, the PMET, and name it that tomorrow, would this be a problem? This really would not because it's not at all similar with regard to the classes. Now, at the, and if you'll remember when we were looking, when I mentioned before about you know, what the trademark office is looking at with your mark, they look at the site, the sound, and the meaning, they would look at, if I were to file PMET for pizza cutters, and they would say, yes, the site, the sound, and the meaning of, and potentially the meaning of both are exactly the same, unless I were to tell them that PMET stood for something like pizza, metal, extraordinary tool, um, then all of a sudden, they would, they would then look to say, see whether or not we're in the same goods and services, and in this case, we're not, so they would probably allow it. 
Now, some other things you might want to look at whenever you're looking at these trademark applications or registrations is the filing date. So this one goes back to 1991. And the way the trademarks work is first using them wins. So you always want to look at you know, when did they file and then when did they, when did they actually get it registered. And you'll see sometimes there can be four or five years lag between filing and registration. And a lot of that is because you can file trademarks for what's known as intent to use. And basically you file the trademark and say, hey, we're, we're planning on using this in the next couple of years, but we're not yet using it in interstate commerce. And we do this at the ranch where we'll test new things, but we haven't yet put them out for everybody, but we want to make sure that you know we're going to protect that name if we can. So we'll file. And then later, we, you can prove how you're using it in interstate commerce. Also on this first page, you'll see you can see who the owner is. And that can be pretty important if it's one of uh, your competitors, maybe, who's there. Or you can even go and search these owners and see, hey, how tough are they at the trademark office? Are they going to try and stop my trademarks? Do they actually pay attention? There's some ways that you can do that. And let me, we're going to click this button here, TSDR. And this is really cool. They've added this in the past couple of years, where all of a sudden you can get, you can actually download all of this into a nice little PDF that's going to tell you, obviously, the, the trademark itself, but then information about the mark, so sometimes you have to give a description if you're doing a logo. What are the goods and services? And they even say when they first used it, so 1987. And if you remember, they filed this in 1991. So they've been using it for a couple years before they filed. And then this, the, this is the basis. So actually, as I said before, you can file what's known as an intent to use, as an ITU. And they did not file it as that. They filed it as a use. So that's what that means right there. You can see who the current owner is. And so whenever there's an assignment with the trademark, it's updated actually within about a day or two on here. It's really incredibly helpful. Uh, you can see who the attorney is on this. So then if you want to reach out to them, it's best to do it through their attorney if you had some questions on, hey, we want to use a similar mark. Do you agree it's not going to be a problem? You can reach out directly to them. And then this is one of my favorite things, is you can actually see the entire history of everything that's happened with this trademark application at the Patent and Trademark Office. So starting down here in 91 in September, you can see it was assigned to the examiner. They got an office action, which means that there was some sort of rejection with regard to the trademark. And then somebody responded to it very soon after. And you can kind of see the whole process that it went through. And then if you really wanted to really get into these and analyze them, you can actually click this Documents tab up at the top. And you can actually open up any of the correspondence between the Patent and Trademark Office. And so we'll let's see, we'll just randomly click this one. And ah, of course, I opened up one that's not going to be real helpful to us. Um, let's see, we will do, this is a notice that was sent to them from the Patent and Trademark Office telling them that the renewal information was acceptable. And sometimes you can go into these and if you see that there's another uh, PMET, so if we were to go back to that other one, because remember there were two, and I said, well, I don't know why this one is dead, you can actually click on it and we'll look at their documents. Ah, oh, and it's too old, they're not there. But very often, you can go in there and you can see what the actual rejection was from the trademark office and think, hey, am I going to get the same rejection as they, are, they did? And if I do, can I overcome it? And if I can't, you know, what, what else can I do instead? So oftentimes, I will go in there and look at those. Now, another example. So, oh, and the other thing I wanted to point out is that if somebody wanted to file for PMAT here, another thing that they, were, they should want to go and do is actually go and look up other versions as well, because it's not going to be 
just uh, PMET that's going to be an issue because we said sight, sound, and meaning. So let's look up another one. Let's see DMET. DMET, PMET sound the same, look kind of similar. Oh, and look, there is one out there. And like we said before, goods and services, that's in class 35. And oh my gosh, look at all the descriptions that they've got on goods and services here. You'd actually have to go through all of these and let's say, oh, our company is going to make ear picks as well. All of a sudden, you're going to have a problem. And you can see this one too is a great example of a trademark that's in multiple classes. So we've got class 35 here, we've got class 36 here, 41, and 42. So this is one where they actually filed in four different classes of goods and services, and they've had to prove that they're using it in all of these. So keep that in mind if all of a sudden you're you know, looking around, don't think, hey, I didn't find exactly the same trademark, so we can do it. Um, you know, you gotta look at, you gotta think about some different variations on the term as well. And, um, and I did get a question here as well, while we were talking about classifications, um, that, that they said that they've heard that the USPTO only accepts international class numbers and no longer uses the US classes. Um, in this example here, as I pointed out, IC, International Class 35, is the start, and then US Class 100, 102, 100. I actually, in my, gosh, 14 years of doing trademarks, I've never used the US classifications. The international classification is kind of taken over as all that the uh, USPTO is really focused on right now and will probably continue to be because of all the uh, treaties that they've signed. So I would continue to just focus on international classifications and just use the ID manual um, as I showed you at the beginning. Now another, ex another trademark that somebody wanted us to look up Okay, and if you remember, I'm just clicking through here, just doing a basic word search, and somebody said, hey, what about Zippo? Zippo lighters. Pretty well-known mark. I know they do more than lighters, but you can see, just putting in Zippo, you're gonna get 91 records. And so what you wanna do is scroll through and then figure out, okay, just start randomly looking at some, and are these of interest to us? So this one is Zippo, international class 14 right here, and it's for watches and jewelry. If you're sitting there saying, hey, uh, you know, I really don't care too much about watches and jewelry, I'm looking at more actual lighters, um, you know, that would not be a problem for you. But then what, here's the other thing that's kind of cool, and I use this all the time when we're looking at competitors, is going down and looking at the registrant. It's Zipmark Inc. And that is actually the a, a company that's owned by the Zippo company and it's just kind of a holding company where they put all of their trademarks, probably their patents as well. But if you can all of a sudden figure out, you know, what's the company name that's owning all the trademarks, you can learn a lot real quickly. And I'll show you how. So we now know that Zipmark here is the owner. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go right back to the opening page. I don't wanna confuse anybody here. Do trademark search. We're gonna do a basic word search, but this time, I'll put in zip mark there. But I'm gonna scroll down and just say, you know what, I just wanna look up the, this by way of owner name, rather than just doing it across the board. Because if I just do zip mark, as a trademark, I'm probably not gonna find a whole lot. Because remember, say no, no records were found. Because this is the company that owns it, not the actual trademark. So we're just gonna look up, hey, what does Zipmark own? And all of a sudden you're gonna find out these are actually all the trademarks owned by Zip, uh, Zipmark using the Zippo brand and variations like Zip Blue. Click on that and you'll see, hey, this, and this is, this is a good example, too, of a logo. So as I was saying before, 
with regard to PMET, as long as those four letters were in order, you got protection. That's not the case here. So in this case, Z-I-P-P-O-B-L-U, it still needs to have this flame at the end and the flame above the eye for this to be protected federally. So this is the logo they'd probably put on their packaging. And then you can see International Class 14 right here, and it's for cigarette and utility lighters of precious metal. So that's what they're getting protection for. And then we go down here and you can see Zipmark is the owner. And then if you're really curious saying, you know what, is this the same as the Zippo Corporation that I've always kind of heard of, you can actually go up here to assign status and find out has there been any change in the assignment. This one, no, no change here. So then what we can do Scroll down to an older one. We'll try this one. And this is blank right here because it means that there's probably just a logo and there aren't any words associated with it. That's the, typically what the case is. And that's what it is here. And you can see if we scroll down here, and again, this was for watches. And if we scroll down and see owner, the registrant, the original uh, filer was Zippo Manufacturing Company. It's kind of like, hey, that's kind of the name I thought it would be under. But then you can see it's now owned by Zipmark. So this would be one where if you click at the assigned status, you'll see, hey, this was originally owned by Zippo, and they assigned it to Zipmark. And you can see who filed it for them. You can see that it was recorded back in 2002 and when the original filing date was back in 2000. So you can learn a lot about you know, who, what, your, how, what name even your competitors are using. And then one other thing I wanted to point out that uh, I want to thank Amy D for telling us about is another site called stopfakes.gov. So this is a site that you can go and um, the government will actually help you, especially if you've got a registered trademark, they will help you stop counterfeiters from getting into the country as well. And that can be a huge resource um, in, in helping you out because obviously you want to be making money and uh, that's going to undermine you, but also you don't want to have your, your mark diminished and if poor quality uh, is, are coming in, you want to make sure that that's not happening as well because that'll undermine your own sales. So that should conclude today's webinar here. And if you have any questions, obviously please shoot me an email at any time. I'm here to help. Uh, David at EurekaRanch.com. Um, barring any technical uh, issues, we will be posting this on our YouTube channel. Just uh, go to YouTube and uh, type in Innovation Engineering and you will find us there. And while I also have you here, I just want to point out we've got some upcoming webinars. As you know, we're all going to start doing these here at the ranch, and so we've got some coming up here uh, in September. We've got the blue cards and how they go into the portal, fail fast, fail cheap, using an IE. And then uh, in September, I'm going to go through step-by-step step how to actually file a copyright application, which is actually fairly easy, and it's something you should be doing on your own and not using a, an attorney to do. It's, it's, it's very simple. So we're going to go through that step-by-step. Step. And uh, we have executive programs coming up uh, in September. And then Innovation College is actually going on right now in the other room right now at the ranch. But our next one is uh, in early October. So check those out and uh, I thank everybody for watching and please shoot me an email if you have any questions. So thank you very much everybody.